Thank you, um, Tiffany. I would like to welcome you also from my side, um, also on behalf of my um, co-authors from TU Braunschweig and uh, TU Munich. And I would like to introduce today a little bit more in detail uh, the injection 3D concrete printing technique, with which you are actually have the possibility to explore also new potentials in concrete 3 printing. And before starting directly uh, with the deep dive into the injection 3 concrete printing technique, I would like to mention a little bit how you can explore the new potentials. Um, so conventional 3D concrete printing, as you currently know it, um, there you subdivide between three topics, which are basically extrusion, material jetting, and selective binding. You already heard about the techniques earlier in the first presentation by Dirk Loke. So in extrusion, we mix our material, we deliver it to a nozzle, and then we apply strands and stack them upon each other. In material jetting, as for example with the shot free 3 printing technique, which is shown here in the middle picture, um, you basically follow the same route with the sub um, difference that you add pressurized air, for example, in the nozzle. But here you still add um, the material layer by layer. And then, of course, you have selective binding. Um, but before, I would like to give you a short um, overview about um, the kind of limitations that we are facing in extrusion and material jetting. So we are stacking layers upon each other, mostly in the vertical direction, only to a limited extent, also incorporating overhangs. So we are a bit limited due to the material properties, um, what consists, um, what is regarding the geometric freedom, because there might be a risk that you have a collapse. And this is actually not exactly the case for selective binding, where you apply a layer of unbound particle bed and then you locally activate it by incorporating uh, activating fluid, which is then in the end building up um, the structure in a vertical way. So um, to show a little close up here, you already see what I'm talking about. Um, so you mainly are talking about horizontal layers, and um, this is something which is somehow limiting the freedom of form in um, the, I call it, conventional concrete 3 printing. And there's the possibility of overcome this limitation um, by the injection 3 concrete printing technique, which I would like to introduce you with a short video from Theo Braunschweig and Theo Munich. Um, so this is actually uh, the gives the possibility to also print directly in three dimensions. So you have the possibility to um, spatial 3D print without any geometrical restrictions due to the vertical stacking of layers. So um, this is something that you've already seen in the first presentation today. But I would like to give you an overview about the basic principle of injection 3D con concrete printing. So very first, I would like to show you um, the potential um, process. So you usually mix your material, I call it now material A. You mix it, you pump it through a hose um, to a nozzle and then you deposit it in a vessel where a material B is placed. And in this case, um, the requirement is material B supports the injected material A. And now I'm very cryptically talking about material A and B, and you may wonder, what are these materials? Or I would like to open up the questions, what can these material be? And um, then we come up with this matrix. Um, so we have a material which is supposed to be injected, and we have a material which is called the carrier liquid. And then you can have either a hardening material, concrete, or you have a non-hardening material, which I now call non-hardening suspension. And this can be basically every um, material, which in the end exhibits a yield stress. There has been already some research about it, and uh, Dirk Loke showed already earlier and mentioned that uh, this may be ultrasound gel, um, which is 
nice because you can look through it and for the video which I just showed earlier it's also um, nice to see directly the structure that you printed. But of course um, there it can be also more sustainable materials uh, like limestone powder suspension, you can use additives and many more things um, in order to also in the end consider a potential reuse of the suspension. So as you see this matrix um, there are in total three feasible subcategories of injection 3D concrete printing which are relevant for construction. Namely, concrete and concrete, suspension and concrete, and concrete and suspension. And um, as I'm aware that there are a lot of architects here in the room, um, I would like to start first with some applications of the injection 3 concrete printing technique um, and um, therefore I would like to start with the suspension in concrete where you can see basically the technique where you fill your concrete in a vessel and then um, inject the non-hardening suspension into the vessel at specific locations. And after hardening of the concrete the non-hardening suspension can be removed leaving cavities or channels behind. And this can be used, for example, to grade concrete components by differentiating its density at specific locations. And in a small-scale experiment um, that is shown here, and um, their uh, ultrasound gel or ultrasound mortar was actually injected in the formwork. In all cases, the displacement suspension um, had a specific volume and this point pattern was followed and um, in the end uh, the volume of the holes that were created were changed uh, by also the variation of the extrusion time. <clears throat> so in this case the printing was realized by printing also the um, holes from bottom to top. So I already mentioned um, that it's conceptually possible to grade material properties. Um, this can be conceptually thought um, in this demonstrator as it was used for facade greening. Um, and it's interesting if you are looking forward for spatial integrity while saving materials. And of course, you can consider additional function integration. The second subcategory I would like to introduce here is the concrete and concrete technique. And um, as mentioned earlier, you inject one concrete with specific properties into another concrete with different properties, actually. And the material properties may mainly differ uh, according to the functional needs in order to locally, for example, strengthen the structure. So here, um, is the only technique which is relevant and um, where you have a permanent mechanical bonding between the two materials A and B. And there's one beam um, in, let's say, a small scale, um, which has been already produced with this technique. And you can see that with one continuous path, you are able to combine two different materials. And this may be, for example, possible in order to combine, for example, an ultra-high performance concrete with a very ecological friendly concrete. This process took less than one minute to print it into the inner structure. So it is a fast process. But of course, this is also now on a small scale. In the future, we also would like to focus, of course, on larger scale. And if we are talking about larger scale, we have to also keep in mind what our material is doing over this time. And we are well aware that concrete is building up yield stress over time. And if we are looking forward to also produce larger structures, then we have to realize that the um, boundary conditions for our print are continuously changing. So we have an increasing force acting on the nozzle and this way we may have to face potential displacement of the robot nozzle. It may be also more difficult to inject our material and potentially we have issues to um, connect the strands of the injected material um, together. And 
As for all challenges, there are of course solutions that need to be investigated further and there are already some on the, on the way and some of these ideas incorporate um, the concept of incorporating more than one robot because you significantly can increase the print time just as you can see here conceptually that are uh, more than one robot working on the same component in order to increase um, the printing speed. And the last technique a subcategory of injection 3D concrete printing is the concrete in suspension technique, which was already introduced earlier this, um, today. So in the third category, it's the possibility to inject a hardening material into a non-hardening concrete, <coughs> uh, into a non-hardening suspension. Um, and the main advantage here is that we are able to produce filigree structures. One of the first um, objects that have been produced um, here in this case at Theo Braunschweig um, was this polyhedral structure, which is obviously very, very lightweight, <coughs> but first large-scale applications have been already introduced. For example, by the company Soliquid, a startup from France who produced this um, artificial reef called Bathy Reef with an industrial robot and this Bathy Reef is supposed to increase the biodiversity in the sea. Um, in this case, this example was installed south of uh, Toulon in a depth of roughly 2.5 kilometers. Um, so this structure is already at a large scale, just to give you a rough number. Um, I think that are um, 15 modules consisting of 30 to 100 kilograms of concrete. Um, this structure is um, bio-inspired, but not mechanically optimized. In terms of mechanical optimization, um, there are also possibilities to um, investigate this further. And um, there, are some, there is some research by Inan Xiao and his uh, co-workers where he um, explored further potential by aligning the spatial stress trajectories with aligning it with the print path. And here, in this case, a coffee table was produced um, which by um, finding the design applying a method called vector-based 3D graphic statics. And 3D graphic statics is a design and analysis method for trusses under static equilibrium and it provides visual information directly between the, um, the relationship between form and force. And with this method, it was possible to design a compression-only structure, um, in this case, this coffee table, which was produced in three elements, uh, which were, in the end, after fabrication, assembled. And with this, it seems like it is easy to master this um, process. But of course, um, this is actually not the case. So um, I would like to also give a short insight into learning from failures, or what you can also call material and process requirements for a successful print. And if you are into 3D printing, you most probably have also experienced the one or the other failure. And if you look in literature, literature then you see um, often um, some work um, which is already describing the failures. So for extrusion, for example, this can be these um, uncontinuous strands, um, which is occurring if you're, for example, going too fast with the nozzle and then you have a local fear, uh, tearing. Or it can be because you're going too slow with the nozzle and then you have this kind of buckling behavior or over extrusion. So the case, uh, this is actually exactly the same case for injection 3D concrete printing. If you have in mind that you want to print a strand which is locally stable um, in the carrier liquid and it has exactly the designated shape, um, then you can kind of depict this kind of setup. And then you have two possibilities, you go too fast or you go too slow. Um, if you're not meeting the optimal extrusion velocity. And then 
you have exactly the same failure. You have either a discontinuous strand, an undersized strand, if you're too fast, or too slow, oversized strand, and undulating strands. And this um, is a failure which is exactly the same as for the extrusion, which is already well known. But additionally, there's another failure mechanism which is um, specific for injection 3D concrete printing. And this is that you're kind of having insufficient positional stability. And then your strand is, for example, sinking to the, bottle, uh, to the bottom. And um, that's, of course, something that we are not interested in. So therefore, it is needed to also, of course, master um, the material properties. And just to give a very, very brief overview here, it is important to master the densities um, of the two materials, carrier liquid and the injected material. It's relevant how you have, um, what kind of a diameter you print, and of course the yield stress of the carrier liquid if of importance. And in the end, you have kind of a failure criterion, and if you're above the red line, then you can produce a stable print. If you're below, you're most likely unstable. Sounds like it is all solved, but um, this is, of course, also not the case at this point in time. So um, you have to think about what's happening directly after injection of um, the injected material, um, but it may occur that the carrier liquid may also change over time. And just to give you an example here, if you're, for example, considering limestone powder suspension, then you will experience, um, if you're not controlling it in the right way, significant sedimentation of the carrier liquid, um, meaning that you're locally changing the properties of your carrier liquid. And Locally changing the material properties means that you potentially will occur, uh, experience a failure of the print at a later point in time. So it's important to also check how to um, master the material properties for a longer period of time. So this is what I would like to give you as an introduction into this um, combination between material and process. And I would like to actually conclude with a video from a successful um, print where we uh, were involved in to, uh, the production of this large-scale demonstrator, which is currently, um, this technique is under display also at the Biennale in Venice, in um, the Biennale in Venice this year, which is um, until this month. So here, um, it was the idea to produce also a large-scale element. It's in total a bridge, uh, the first overall and large-scale structure, um, which has a length of 4.2 meters. The Gloco already showed some pictures earlier today. And um, with this, um, you can see that you, of course, can apply the vector-based 3D graphic statics, which has been here um, conducted by TU Munich. And um, then, in the end, there were five modules printed, and here you see that the smaller vessel, in smaller vessels it was possible to produce single components. And in the end, here it was not um, this ultrasound gel, what was used for um, the fabrication process, but it was a limestone powder suspension, um, which was for at least the duration of the print, stable. And of course, after the fabrication, you have to deal with digging out the single components. You can lift these components out of the material carefully, and then clean it and as here are um, different modules which were combined, um, we also scanned the structure, produced single joints in order to, in the end, put the modules together, which was actually not done 
by robots, but still, this is manual fabrication. And in the end, you can see here the first above ground construction component, um, which is produced at all. And with that, I would like to also conclude my talk. And I would like to thank you for your attention. And if you have further um, questions, I'm here to answer them now or later. Thank you. in concrete method, uh, it was kept my attention, how exact is the um, execution compared to the prior design? Because I imagine it to be not random, but you cannot really see what's happening inside. <laughs> so how uh, well is it, uh, or how uh, usable could it be for static application, or is it rather sculptural because it's not as reliable? Um, to, you know. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I know what you mean. Um, so at this stage of development, there have been only a very, very few experiments exploring this subcategory. So at this point in time, I would mention that it's not very exact. But if you really understand what are the forces which are acting, um, how to control the material properties, then you will be for sure able to control, exactly control where the material is placed and to create also components which are exactly as designed. So, but this, uh, to be uh, mentioning, this is just a few first experiments that were already conducted. Thank you. Um, any other questions from the audience? Uh, okay, one more here. Thanks, Inka. Um, super, super interesting. I really, really enjoyed uh, the presentation. I was wondering, with regards to this last um, uh, project that you were showing, what do you foresee are the next steps that you'll be taking in the research in order to, in some way, ensure replicability or scalability? Um, that's an easy... Um, answer, reinforcement integration. Because currently, um, so if you design it perfectly and you print it perfectly and you definitely have a compression only structure that's easy, you can only work with concrete. But as soon as bending comes into play, you have issues of breakage of the objects, uh, so therefore reinforcement becomes mandatory. That's the biggest challenge, but there are of course further, but to keep it simple, that's the next step. Uh, any other questions? Very, very interesting uh, lecture. I have a curiosity. Did you make some tests on the concrete strut, uh, like uh, in compression or bending, just to evaluate their uh, capacity? Um, no, at this point in time, we of course do know the material properties itself of the printed object, but uh, we haven't done material load tests yet. Um, that's of course something that will be envisaged in the future, but yeah. So it's a rather new technique uh, which will be developed further now. And then this will be one of the, of course, of the open questions which need to be answered. We have time for one more question, so... Uh... Thanks for the presentation, it was super interesting to see the trick. Um, so, can you give us an idea of the scale boundaries? So, is it, what do you think would be the biggest concrete element that you can extrude under these conditions? Or do you have a, a wish so, of a structured element in the end? So, um... I think it depends basically on the technical possibilities that you do have. 
Um, if you have large enough robots, then you can, of course, or if you have a large reach, then you can basic, you basically need to fill your vessel. I could also picture that you use, for example, the concrete and concrete technique on construction site. So just have your uh, formwork there, and then there's a mobile robot printing into the formwork where you want to strengthen your structure. So I think we are not basically that limited. Um, so I guess I think we are really facing large scale, especially with the possibility of mobile robots. We have a lot of chances to explore this even further. Thank you so much, Nika, for the wonderful presentation. Um, Thank you.